Previously on the Main Street Chronicles. Well, it was another zippity doo dah day here at the Museum of Imagination when Archimedes and Mr. Bluebird introduced our travelers to Disney legend Tony Baxter. We pulled back the curtain a bit and shared an unbuilt land that Tony had dreamed up and how he worked throughout his career to make parts of it come to life. Let's listen in and see what colors Archimedes paints as he continues to introduce you to the legends of Walt Disney Imagineering. Well, are you ready to explore? Yeah, we are so excited to see what is in store for us. Right, Walt? Well, clearly he's speechless. Maybe even a little stunned. Walt, are you okay? Oh, ho, ho, ho. he will be just fine. Let's press on. I would like to now introduce you both to John Hench. In 1939, he joined Disney as a sketch artist in the story department, working first on Fantasia. John was always eager to learn and he accepted a variety of tasks over the years, including painting backgrounds on Dumbo and creating layouts for the Three Caballeros. He was also an art supervisor for Make Music Mine. He handled art treatments for So Dear to My Heart, as well as handling the coloring and styling for Peter Pan, and the animation effects for The Living Desert. In 1954, his special effects work on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea earned John an Oscar. He later left the studio that same year to work at Wed Enterprises. His first assignment was to design attractions for the original Tomorrowland in Disneyland. Later in 1960, John worked closely with Walt in developing the pageantry for the opening and closing ceremonies and daily presentations for the 8th Winter Olympic Games at Squaw Valley, as well as designing the iconic Olympic torch. John worked on attractions for the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair before going on to help master plan Walt Disney World and Tokyo Disneyland. He was a key figure in the conceptualization and creation of Epcot Center and developed ideas for theme parks, including Disney's California Adventure, Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park, and Tokyo Disney Sea. But before we go into his work with Wed, I want to show you something very, very special here. We have them behind this curtain to protect them during the construction. Dude, look at the, oh, look at that. These are incredible. Well, it's nice to know you found your voice again, Walt. <laughs> Archimedes, what can you tell us about these? Well, I mean, let's, let's, um, let's give Archimedes a little bit of a break. Why don't we just push the button and let Brian and Stokes tell us about it? One of the very first formal portraits of Mickey Mouse was painted by Disney legend John Hinch for a very special event a tribute to the character's 21st birthday that was published in a major article featured in Collier's Magazine on April 9, 1949. But it was in 1953 that the tradition of an official Mickey portrait began. When Walt Disney encouraged a few studio artists to depict Mickey at age 25 and submit the art to him as a sort of internal contest, an oil painting by Hinch, whose credits at the time ranged from background artist on Fantasia and Dumbo to color stylist on Cinderella and Peter Pan, won the day. Mickey Mouse's 25th birthday, 1953. Mickey Mouse is seen in an office reminiscent of Walt's. There is a world globe situated in the lower right corner in the front of a well-stocked bookshelf. Mickey, dressed in his classic red shorts, white gloves, and yellow shoes, casually leans against a cupboard where a trophy cup and framed photo sit. John wrote in his seminal book, Designing Disney, published by Disney Editions in 2003, in deciding how to approach the portrait, I remembered the awards I had seen in Walt's office and thought of Mickey being recognized around the globe. Though not prominent, the globe is an important element, according to the artist. As an animated character, Mickey reflects Walt's caring and understanding of people. People relate to him emotionally as a personality. As a result, he has become a part of not only American, but worldwide folklore as well. For Mickey's 50th birthday in 1978, Hinch again was asked to provide an official portrait. And for this depiction, Hinch decided that it was important to show Mickey engaged in the company's newest projects. For Mickey's 50th birthday portrait, I posed him in front of the original Epcot model, Hinch said. Walt Disney World Resort had opened in 1971, and the company was in the midst of designing its third theme park, Epcot Center, which would open four years later in 1982. 
The shadow that Mickey casts over the model was essential, Hinch said. Mickey's shadow lets the viewer know that they are looking at a model, and not through a big picture window at a distance view of Epcot. Mickey Mouse's 60th birthday, 1988. For Mickey's 60th birthday portrait, our intention was to announce the Walt Disney Company's new ventures in Paris, Hinch said. This portrait shows a new backdrop, that of an office wall with framed photos of some of Mickey's most popular roles and his friend Minnie. I began with the idea of marking the newest spot that demonstrated Mickey's ever-growing worldwide influence. I decided to use a globe as a prop with a miniature French flag pinpointing the location of the new park. Over the years, Mickey's personality unfolded and matured just like a real human being's. As a cartoon character, we have been able to give him the human qualities that Walt sought in animation. Of all the Disney cartoon characters, Mickey best symbolizes growth. For Mickey's 70th birthday portrait, I seated Mickey on a high stool to suggest his eternal youthfulness, Hinch said, and dressed him in an orange sweater like Walt's favorite old work sweater. In the portrait, Mickey is reading a selection of birthday cards, including those from his old pals Goofy, Donald, and Horace Horsecollar. But the most notable object in the portrait is the portrait within a portrait that can be seen over Mickey's shoulder. Behind Mickey, I painted a portrait of Walt. I tried hard to get a good likeness, Hinch said. Optimism is the sustaining quality of Mickey's character and conveys a feeling of hope to others. Walt's uncanny connection to the audience allowed him the opportunity to define a character that touched the hearts of almost everyone. Mickey's 75th birthday, 2003. In 2003, an amazing 54 years after his first venture into Mickey portraiture, Hench created his final celebration of Mickey's birthday. Just as in that early portrait of Mickey produced in 1949, Mickey pulls back a curtain to present a globe, this time it is positioned to show Asia, with a Mickey flag prominently pinned at the site of the future Hong Kong Park. In the windows behind are celebratory fireworks, featuring a small 75 high in the sky. According to Hench, Walt chose to develop the art of animation and the theme parks around classic tales that appeal to all of us and transcend our differences, a sentiment that will always keep Mickey in the hearts of millions around the world. As we admire these paintings, one thing that is apparent is the use of color and John was a master when it came to the color used on film and in the parks. Imagineers actually used color theory in both scientific and psychological applications. These were developed and taught by John, who brought his expertise on color and design to every Disney park. Colors work with or against one another to draw the eye or subdue an unwanted intrusion. John was able to use and ultimately teach Imagineers how color could be used to signal mood as well as telegraph the story. Yeah, and even going back to talking about these portraits that John was doing for Mickey's birthdays, that same use of color and shading to direct the eye was used in these portraits. Uh, it, again, it shows kind of like the masterful grasp he had on color to be able to, even in something as simple as a portrait, guide people's eyes uh, to exactly where the action is and exactly what he wants them to see. It's really interesting when you think about the different techniques that Imagineers use to help create a story and create an attraction. You've got the Omnimover that helped direct your line of sight, and now you have color that we've learned about that is also helping direct sight. And then not only that, it's bringing attention to different aspects of a show scene. Exactly. And the use of color in the theme parks is something that's not really in your face to the guests. It's something that's so simple that people don't really notice that it's used to direct them to look at something or to walk in a certain direction or to make something else in the parks pop out to them. Take Main Street USA, for example. You've got the red pavement, which is representative of the red carpet at a movie premiere. But on top of that, we've also learned throughout our research that the red was used not only for that, but also to help the trees and landscape really pop with the green. So green against red, we've learned, actually helps accentuate the green. So there are multiple reasons why they use these different colors. Sam, are you crying? There's no crying here. There's no crying in Disney history. She's crying, Archimedes. I am. These are just so beautiful, and they're just bringing a lot of emotion out of me right now. Here you go, my dear. Please take my handkerchief. Thank you. Well, based on Sam's reaction, and to be perfectly honest, my own reaction to this, I'm beyond excited to see what you've got in store for us next. Why, yes, step this way. I think you both may like this. Welcome to Tomorrowland. <laughs> I can see I was right. This is absolutely stunning. I want you to focus on the building in the very back. You should hopefully recognize it. It kind of looks like Space Mountain, but it's different. What's going on? Space Mountain was originally developed as a concept for Disneyland's 1967 overhaul of Tomorrowland, pitched by Walt Disney himself. 
beginning development in late 1964 under the title of Spaceport and designed by John, the attraction would be a four-tracked roller coaster in the dark with controlled space lighting and projections to simulate space travel. However, the concept would be stalled as a result of the technology not being quite there, space concerns regarding the four-track concept, and a lack of a corporate sponsor. About seven years later, the concept was revived to fill a need in the Magic Kingdom for a thrill ride attraction. With advances in computer control technology and the sponsorship of RCA, Space Mountain's construction began on December 15, 1972. To accommodate the attraction's planetarium and two tracks, Space Mountain's broad sloped roof was made up of 72 precast concrete beams, each measuring around 117 feet in length and weighing 74 tons. Taking three years to build, Space Mountain stands over 183 feet tall with a diameter of over 300 feet. The attraction was dedicated on January 15, 1975 by RCA Chairman Robert Sarnoff, Disney CEO Don Tatum, and Apollo 15 astronaut Colonel James Irwin, who took the first official ride. The elaborate ceremony, featuring a 2,000-piece band, fireworks, and a balloon launch, was the subject of the Wonderful World of Disney episode, Welcome to the World. In the early days of Disneyland, Walt created a new rule for the Imagineers. I want you to go into the park at least every two weeks and stand in the queues with our guests. The objective was to better understand the guest's experience. He wanted this to be the roadmap that would lead Imagineers on ways to better enhance the parks. Space Mountain is a great example of this practice being put into play. With the creation of the Matterhorn, Walt knew that this park could have more thrill rides, but they had to fit the themes already set in place. Walt and his Imagineers were on the forefront of ride design, and this is a great example, with the concepts of adding darkness to the ride as well as computerizing the ride experience. When it was designed, it was groundbreaking, and this would become the standard for roller coaster design from here on. Yeah, and Walt was somebody that always knew what he wanted, even if it couldn't be done yet. And Space Mountain is another example of that. Walt had the idea several years before uh, his death that he wanted some sort of a Space Mountain, kind of like a follow-up to Matterhorn. He's famous for saying, you gave me a Matterhorn Mountain, why can't I have a Space Mountain? Again, Imagineering being on the forefront, once they had the technology, they were able to get the ball rolling on this and really, again, knocked it out of the park. And John Hinch being uh, on this project, again, shows how important he was to this company. You know, it's a real shame that Walt never got to see this concept come to fruition. But we can take solace in the fact that John, who was the one who originally designed the original Space Mountain, was the one who was able to see it to completion from design all the way up to the 183-foot spires. Exactly, and it is a good showcase of his talents. This takes us away from what we were talking about earlier with his grasp on color and shows that he can do the same thing with attraction design. At Walt Disney Imagineering, there is no such thing as a bad idea. It just may not be the right time for it. So all ideas are cataloged and stored for when the time may be right for them. Well, I mean, that's a pretty nice lesson to take away from this. Honestly, I mean, thank you, Archimedes. You are most welcome. I have one more artifact to show you, and we need to open that door there and walk into the soundstage. Soundstage? Oh, you'll see. Whoa. Whoa! I can't believe my eyes. Is that... Is that the original Epcot Center model? It most certainly is. Let's learn a little about the early days of Epcot Center. In 1993, John said this in an interview discussing Walt's vision for Epcot and what came to become Epcot Center. Walt had this ambition to open this place which, when you really analyze it, was a place where people could get better information. He thought that all the evils of the world were because people didn't get the right information, so people didn't react right. People were capable of all kinds of evils because they were operating on the wrong information. So he thought he could build a place where he could straighten out some of those things, and when I think of the guts it took, it's so surprising to think of charging admission at the front gate for a guy to come in to lose some of his prejudices. In 1976, Imagineers attempted to decide what the scale of Epcot could be, given the resources available. The nation again found itself in the midst of an energy crisis and an economic downturn, and despite extensive recruitment efforts, it began to appear that not enough corporations and foreign governments could be recruited to make both World Showcase and the Future World Theme Center economically viable. Proposals to scale down the concept continued throughout the year. In late 1976, with executive review pending, Legendary Imagineers Marty Scalar and John Hench famously pushed the models together and Epcot Center was born. The new park would now have two main areas, Future World and World Showcase. One would be a showcase for the latest interventions of American industry. 
the other would be a permanent international exhibition. But while this Epcot Center sounds familiar, it had major differences from the park that we know today. Guests would enter this Epcot Center through World Showcase, which would serve as the park's main street. A variety of attractions planned for the international pavilions included a Rhine River cruise through Germany, a cable car ride past the Venezuelan waterfalls, and an Omnimover trip through sumptuous Japanese gardens and scenery. Facing World Showcase across a large central lagoon and past a cluster of towering spires was Future World. Here, the Epcot theme show would serve as the introductory presentation of Epcot Center. Focusing on man and his spaceship Earth, the show offered a moving experience combining a one-of-a-kind theater with film and automated techniques. Afterward, guests could learn about the future of a number of fields by visiting other Future World shows and exhibits. They could even take a panoramic view of the park from a restaurant and cocktail lounge in one of the spires overhead. Future World's pavilions were grouped into two major areas on the east and west sides of the park. They were connected to the Communicore by two malls and featured pavilions devoted to related fields of study. A major shift in Epcot planning occurred between April and May of 1977 when Imagineers decided to flip the positions of Future World and World Showcase. This marked the advent of what the company announced as Master Plan 5. Heralded as a conceptual breakthrough, it presented a park similar to the one we know today. Imagineers now had a clear vision for most of the Future World pavilions. For the first time, we see attractions based on the land, the seas, and the rests that feel familiar. Keeping with Master Plan 5, World Showcase now circled a lagoon instead of a plaza, although it still resembled the sleek semi-circle design of previous schemes. This would change in 1978 when legendary Disney art director and Imagineer Harper Goff designed a World Showcase based on individual buildings heavily themed to the architecture of specific nations. Spaceship Earth, an evolution of the earlier Epcot theme show, was now the dominant visual icon of the park. After much courting, Disney finally had a critical breakthrough on January 6, 1978, when General Motors signed an agreement to sponsor a transportation pavilion in Future World. The GM deal signaled a vote of confidence in the Imagineers' plans and gave Disney's management leeway to proceed. Soon after, on January 27th, Exxon signed a deal to sponsor the Energy Pavilion. It was after that we would see the breaking of ground for Epcot Center. Finally, after years of planning, ground was broken for Epcot Center on October 1st, 1979. You know, with Walt gone, somebody needed to step up and be the visionary that would help lead WDI into the future. And John, along with Marty, were the ones who took the role, and ultimately, they were the ones who would help solve the problems that would plague early Epcot. Yeah, we know Walt Disney is a -a one-of-a-kind visionary for an entire lifetime, but John Hinch and Marty Sklar added into that as well. Both had to have equal uh, amount of vision here to bring this project to reality. Uh, for example, being able to pull such a big concept like Walt Disney's idea for Epcot out of his head and be able to tweak it without Walt's guidance there and actually build something that would be meaningful to people is a mammoth task. It really is, and and back to what we were talking about in in the story, the final version that we know of is Master Plan 5. So think of what the other earlier four designs for Epcot were and how detailed they were and how much they had to decipher to try to get to where they were in Master Plan 5. That had to have been, like you said, a monumental task. And John and Marty, you know, with all the research that we've done And all the stories that we've heard about Marty and John and all of these other legendary Imagineers, I personally can't think of two better individuals to help lead the future of wet enterprises that would later become Walt Disney Imagineering and ultimately help Walt's vision, even though it wasn't the complete vision, help a portion of his vision come to life. Well, what do you think of that? Hmm. Your reactions are practically perfect in every way. (laughs) So we decided to choose John as an Imagineering legend because he represents blank to us. Stokes, what word did you choose for John? So the word that I came up with to describe John is the word confidence. And I think this really speaks to the way that he carried himself throughout his projects uh, with the Disney company. Uh, Again, if we look at the paintings that he did with Mickey on his birthdays, the confidence that he had to have in order to uh, create something that would be acceptable. I mean, that's a pretty big honor to be asked to be the guy that creates those. Uh, all the way down to what we were just discussing with Epcot. Bringing that idea out of Walt's head, and again, the Epcot that we ended up with is almost nothing like the original idea that Walt had, but being able to pick certain things out of there and actually bring those to life for guests to enjoy is incredible. 
you know, you make a great point there because confidence, I also think that that's, that's a great word to describe him. In, in the reference that you had for the, the portraits, John was a background artist. He wasn't a character designer. And to have the confidence to enter the, I guess it was a contest back in the day, to draw Mickey for his birthday portrait, that had to take some guts. And from somebody who wasn't as familiar with character design, I think that that shows immense confidence. Exactly. And the ability to understand both the guy that he's working for here, Walt, and the character that he's dealing with. A lot of times that he's painting these portraits of Mickey, you can see Walt's personality being brought out in Mickey himself. So, Brian, what word did you choose to describe John? So, I'm going to need you to go with me on this one, because it's not one word, it's, it's a few words. So, I'm going with Master of Color. And we've heard a story that I'd like to share with you guys that, that really brings this to life. So, as the story goes, during the creation of Epcot Center, the Imagineers were trying to come up with the correct color to paint the building so that they could blend in with the surroundings. They put together all of their ideas and it just wasn't working. So they went back to Glendale, pitched the colors to John, and asked for his advice. He said, you're all wrong. This is the color combination that you need to use. Well, they said, John, you haven't been there in 10 years. Well, it's true, John hadn't been to Walt Disney World or Central Florida in almost 10 years, but he said, I can never forget that color. This is the color combination to use, go use it. The Imagineers went back to Central Florida, and sure enough, John was correct. And that's the blue that you'll see painted on buildings at Walt Disney World, and it's called Blend in Blue. So that right there to me speaks to how much of a master of color John was, and that is his mastery of color is woven through every single park, because every single color in the Disney parks has been created and nurtured by John Hench and the people who learn directly from John. And that's something that blows my mind. As somebody that doesn't really have an artistic uh, bone in my body, blue is blue is blue to me. And just looking at how he can remember the specific shade of blue in Central Florida a decade later and be able to play off of that in order to make other colors work the way they need to within the parks is something, again, that just blows my mind. Tune in next month as Archimedes leads us into a new adventure in the Hall of Imagineering as we learn the told and untold stories of another Imagineer. You've been listening to the Main Street Chronicles, part of the Imagination Radio Network and a BRS production. Would you like to go on another adventure?